Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Arjun. The world is changing in front of us, and there are loads of implications for India. How does India deal with it, all these changes, and what are the changes? What started these changes is something that we are going to discuss in this conversation with Lieutenant General Raj Shukla, who is here with me, sir. First of all, thank you so much for your second appearance on Dev Talks. I'm um, grateful for you uh, who have taken out the time to help us understand what's happening around us, sir. Thank you, thank you, Ali. Great pleasure. It's been a uh, been some time, but great pleasure to return to the channel. Sir, my simple question to you to open this conversation would be: What has made the world change? I mean, there there are everybody knows this is happening, that is happening. But what are the factors, or what are the incidents, or what are the things that you would like to attribute the global change to first and foremost? Sir? You know, let me say that in all humility, I'm, I'm no expert, but uh, what we shall discuss today are, uh, of course, a distillation of my own views, uh, professional acumen, and primarily judgment over the years. I mean, facts are there for all of us to see. Now, what could be unique or what could be different is what we interpret from those facts. And that really is, is, is the issue. I have one set of interpretations. You could have another set of interpretations, which is nearer to the truth. That really is the uh, challenge. And here now the basic question, you know, that you raised: What are those three to four things which I th which um, are impacting the global order? One is uh, the U.S.-China context and a contest and within that the changing power balance. Uh, I think in my view it is changing at a far rapid pace than what people think, far more rapid pace than people think. So the dynamics of the uh, US-China balance is of course the first factor. The other is uh, these two seminal events. One is Ukraine which has been a watershed of many sorts and it has brought out, what shall I say, uh, new uh, uh, lessons for the international community and for the international order, which we should you know, look at very carefully. And of course, is the and third is the pandemic, which you know really challenged a lot of fundamental assumptions about uh, globalization, supply chains. So all these put together, I think, uh, mean that uh, to me that the world order is changing in some very significant ways and now since India and th this change in the world order is somehow synchronous with India's rise. Uh, this rise is very much inevitable uh, or let me say there are a lot of good things about this rise but we have to be equally cautious of or watchful about some of the things that go wrong and uh, therefore wisdom would demand that we explore all these facts with detachment, with clarity and with honesty, so that uh, uh, in this period from now to 2047, which is, you know, pe people say is Amrit Kal, and it's not Amrit Kal just because the stars have somehow come together, but a lot of things in India's economic growth, its demographic destiny, all of these are coming together and it could be one of those moments in India's journey where uh, we could turn around uh, significantly. And uh, the time period also is not too long. You know, this 25 years have a significance because in accord with our demographic metrics, uh, it is vital that we achieve what we have to in this time frame because if we don't, we too stand the... Uh, we are faced with the prospect of growing old before we get rich. So, you know, all these things put together uh, tell me that these next 25 years are going to be very significant. I appreciate the line growing old before we get rich. I guess that's something that you can attribute to China, which is where my next question would come to, sir. Uh, the Chinese would obviously want to angle on to create a global world order favorable to them. And there are a few obstacles within that. Of course, the major obstacle is the US. Uh, there is, of course, now a Chinese acknowledged India obstacle. What do you say about that uh, with regards to the Chinese themselves now saying that India is rising up, India is becoming a great power, which is the words that was used by the Chinese foreign ministry. 
you see over the last just <coughs> sorry six or shall i say four to six years and more significantly over the last year a lot of writings have come out about the chinese and these writings are from internal chinese documents that people have got access to some declassification of american documents and a host of books have come out for example uh, aaron freeberg have we got china wrong alan joski spies lies uh, 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 ian easton inside china's global strategy uh, i think it's colby about you know the strategy for china kishore mehboobani raja mohan a whole lot of people have been writing about china uh, and when i go to martin jacquis of course those two stalwarts martin jacquis and michael pinsbury they have uh, what shall i say updated their their seminal books the 100 year marathon and the other one when china rules the world and when you look at these and and now relate them to events around you there are some very fresh insights which are uh, which you know um, which, which which seem to be surfacing so let's just let me focus on some of these key issues and uh, how do i look at it see when i look at the world around us though the purists are in denial it does seem to me that we are in some kind of cold war to voice uh, this very viral and viral and strategic competition between us and china is on and it could have you know violent manifestations uh within this you know henry kissinger is called this cold war he says i think about a year back he said we are in the foothills neil ferguson says you know that we are maybe in the mid slopes i think we are very close to the peak it is a very intense cold war and ukraine perhaps was the first hot war of that cold war the first hot war of that cold and uh, this cold war of course i mean just let's dissect it for a moment has new protagonists you have usa uh, it could be the declining hegemon or now that you know us has got wind of the challenge of the chinese challenge usa has this great power of uh, reenergizing rebooting itself you know it could be that its innovation uh, and all its you know creative energies come together and once again it it remains the 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 hegemon but a very strong contest is on and so now you have in this cold war usa and the west on one flank and china which is really the i mean i don't know who somebody used this expression the alpha dog of international politics and russia on the other flank and russia is this weak i think this is john mashaimer's uh, phrase weak big power which means what that despite its many economic weaknesses and other issues it consistently punches above its weight it punches above its weight uh, you know so it is this this is the new cold war 2.0 let's call it cold war 2.0 now india has friends on both sides of the divide you have us and you have russia but unlike cold war 1.0 one of the key protagonists this time is not only a competitor and an adversary but a proximate adversary so india could be in contest or we are already in contest with the world's superpower with the world's uh, superpower and on all accounts a relationship with china at least in recent years has been tested and to quote the external affairs minister even fragile and dangerous and we all know what's happening along the nac let me give you a sense of the changing economic gravity there are many estimates which now tell you that you know plus minus uh, few percentage points here and there by 2035 while china will account for 24% of global gdp the americans will be account for a mere 14 now look at that 24 14 think of us who have grown up in this unipolar moment where it was nothing but usa in this altered economic dynamic look at the changes that will take part in the great power relationship and look at the hot spots india may be you no know, people have started saying ladai nahi hone wali wars are a thing of the past 
Look at what's happening in Europe. In the instrument of force is back in your strategic calculus. There could be new hotspots in West Asia, uh, given the fact that, you know, Iran's uh, weaponization of its nuclear program is now moving pretty fast. It's close to that 90% uh, level. Uh, there could be an Iran-Israel conflagration. Now, the consequences of this are that American economic might and its strategic military prowess will be, could be split across three theaters. Europe, it could be West Asia, and of course the Indo-Pacific, Taiwan, uh, and all that. So there are huge and new challenges before India's foreign policy and our strategic economy. It is a changed world when you are in a contest with the world's superpower. And therefore, we need to carefully analyze what are the choices before us, what are the, you know, in terms of partnerships, alignments. I'm not saying that you get into any alliances, but our strategic autonomy, which is a very wise, uh, or shall I say, uh, way of looking at the world, has to be freshly calibrated. It has to be freshly calibrated. Now, in this Cold War 2.0, let me just labor on two more issues which I think are very significant. You know, this whole business of China's peaceful rise, now turns out, it turns out that it was a big charade. I mean, at no stage did China ever, in its own mind, think that the rise would be peaceful. To put it bluntly, they fooled the USA, the West, and the rest of us into thinking that there would be this peaceful rise. <coughs> so it's, and uh, you know, it seems to be a very surgically executed, orchestrated campaign of deception in recent times. And somehow it should not surprise us because if you look at the Chinese, you know, there's, they lay a great emphasis on deception in their statecraft. When they say to cross the oceans, deceive the heavens. Now, see, I'll just labor on this for a moment. What does it mean? It means that when you have an adversary, it is your business to fool him. It is your business to deceive him and deceive him so much that by the time, so it's a sophisticated deception. By the time he realizes that he's being deceived, it's too late. Look at America's predicament today, 24-14, too late. And the other thing about their deception is that, you know, keep doing the same thing so often that it lulls the opponent into thinking that see, there is nothing much that could happen. So look at all this salam, these things along the LAC. Keep doing it, keep doing it. And lull India to thinking, into thinking that ye are choti moti cheeze hongi grey zone ki. And once you lull India into thinking in that fashion, do all out conflict. Now, I'm not saying it will happen, but it is ingrained into their deception. It is ingrained into the way they think. If there is nothing right or wrong about it. For example, somebody said that Clausewitz, you know, Western think thinkers, he says trickery, treachery, these are weapons of the weak. Sun Tzu says they are weapons of choice. So we should get, you know, uh, uh, say that China, fool Kardia, look at this deceitful China. China is like that. Their statecraft is like that. And I can give you, uh, you know, some examples of this. You read Michael Pillsbury. He says that where in the 50s, Mao and Chao and Lai would reach out to Roosevelt and George Marshall and say that the Chinese Communist Party is not really a very serious business. Give us weapons, give us technology, give us money. Once we get a little better, we'll become like you. I mean, this is staggering. Then this whole business is interrupted briefly because of, uh, uh, you know, Korea. The idea stagnates for a while. And Kissinger reestablishes the idea. Now, we all know or we think that it was America which reached out to Beijing. On the premise that come join us, join the WTO, and we'll integrate into us. 
in the hope, even the assurance, that you will become like us. So there will be no conflict. But the Chinese had different ideas. They reached out to the Americans and saw this was a seminal moment, of course, you know, first to take care of the Soviets. With this lovely phrase that ally with Wu in the East to opposed Y in the North. I mean, look at this. And, uh, if they were not in our adversary, it is sheer brilliance. And they do this and Kissinger, you know, gives so these offers or gives the Soviets uh, gives the Chinese satellite imagery about Soviet locations. He offers US bombers and nuclear weapons to be located in China in the event of a Soviet invasion. He gives uh, the Secretary of the Navy in the Reagan administration flies and offers Mark 46 torpedoes, anti-submarine and anti-ship torpedoes to the Chinese. So, ye China ko mazboot kisne banaya hai? America ne. Or kyo banaya ho? Beku thodi na te. They were fooled. Now, this is the quality of deception in their statecraft. This is their long-range thinking. You see how... I'm quoting Kissinger here. He talks about this sense of time. He says, when the Americans think of time, they think about a day or a date in a calendar. When the Chinese think about time, they place an event in a dynasty. And out of the 14 dynasties they've had, 10, the duration of 10 dynasties has been longer than all of American history. So they say, we are such an old civilization. What will you teach us democracy? We have our own way of looking at things. Now, you see, when you put all this together, now see what happens. While the Shanghai investors were busy making their money, the Chinese hawks were always clear that they were making use of American largest to create a strategic techno-military uh, strategic techno military enterprise of global quality. Look at that now. It's such a concerted endeavor that you know the global fronts of the Ministry of State Security, which is a 100,000 strong force, it penetrates universities, fools, an Australian Prime Minister, the US Congress, academics, think tanks. And uses all oh, this premise that, you know, we are a poor country, we will become like you, <coughs> we are not so ideological. technology IP And this was actually hidden by it. This is hidden by it. And now that they have become powerful 24-14 in a world-class military, they are going loud and proud. Why should it surprise us? And now, you see, some of the uh, academics in China, they say, Mao gave us the revolution, Deng gave us wealth, Z will restore us to greatness. What is restoring us to greatness? Taiwan, legitimate territories, could be around Arunachal Pradesh. My plea is, please look at the Chinese. Do not look at the Chinese with strategic innocence. They are... Look at it. I'm not saying that we suddenly go aggressive and, you know, start uh, jackbooting. That's not the point. Look at them with wisdom. And look at the evidence that is before you. I'll just tell you now, see a few of the things that they are doing. Just look at the Thousand Talents plan. Now, what are the Thousand Talents plan? He says that the contest between superpowers is primarily a contest for talent. Without talent, you know, it is like growing, a, uh, it is like a tree with no roots and a fountain with no water. Look at talent. Then in the Thousand Talents Plan, I'm amazed, Ian B. Eastern Valley Kitab, the stated objective is to recruit geniuses from around the world. To do what? Of course, to power Chinese science and technology, but also to give a fillip to the PLA. Their civil military fusion is so strong and so brilliant, there are no silos. Seamlessly. And it is documented. The linkages between the CCP and the PLA and the Thousand Talents Plan is documented. 
who is powering some of it is no there is no denying today that china american admissions that china is leading in many of these what we call storm of new technologies ai hypersonics robotics all this you know which will be of great use in digital combat who is powering this noble laureates now just if you think you know i am just shooting off the hip read in eastern's book i'll give you names dr frank chenning yang he is a noble laureate in physics he was one of those associated with the nuclear reactor dr andrew yao winner of the am turing award who's am turing father of artificial intelligence they have created this zhengua con district which is like the silicon valley all this is you being used and this innovation is being used to uh to drive the pla's progress and now look just see how the pla has transformed firstly the pla is not a normal military you know it is the it is the armed wing of the ccp it has extraordinary social uh strategic political influence at 2 million it is the largest army on the earth today it has the most sophisticated intelligence gathering machine people say in history i forget who but this is somebody who 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 has said it and look at the journey of the pla you know today z has personally nursed its rise i think general mcmaster says it has registered a 44 fold increase over the last three decades 44 fold not really in terms of you know linear metrics but when you take an aggregate military view the pla defense budget has grown 800% over the last three decades 800% they don't believe in these theories you know the first you will grow economically then we will grow militarily they do it together many phrases of the chinese economic uh, evolution has been shaped by the defense industry and they have carried out this very measured and smart asymmetric balancing of usa which is a lesson that we must learn it's not merely about budgets see america's defense budget is thrice that of china china's defense budget is thrice that of india why is it that china causes displacement anxiety in washington and we do not cause similar displacement anxiety in beijing it's not just budgets but if we are slow in making theater commands structural corrections cultural transformation militarily we will continue to lag it has been transformed from humility to hubris humility when they said that you know we are a guerrilla army we are not technologically adept so they read people like andrew marshall they dis- dissected the uh, american um, strategies in gulf war one and two that was a period of humility so my whole so th- that is one and now see look at the changing power balance and here i'll quote neil ferguson to you in terms of the military possible military play in a taiwan contingency when he says you know while the usa's verbal commentary is growing stronger in terms of comprehensive military capacities usa appears weaker and there are many admissions of ipacom commanders and all which seem to suggest that in terms of the americans ability to you know penetrate the first iron chain and so on and so forth there are a whole lot of naval military metrics which suggest that taiwan may turn out to be america's swiss moment this is need for you that moment in 1956 when britain the imperial lion was exposed as a paper tiger american inaction or the loss of taiwan would be seen all over asia as the end of american predominance it would cause a run on the dollar it could also turn out to be a seminal moment in the sino american contest and big power politics now link that with that 2414 a possible erosion of american military power and look at the huge consequences for the international order let us also think very seriously look at from the american point of view their view of their own national interest 
they are were very clear that in ukraine they will not intervene militarily baki sab kuch theek hai but military intervention there was they were very clear despite all their protests it does seem to me rather unlikely that they will intervene militarily in taiwan especially in view of the change military metrics it seems unlikely could be it seems you know unlikely and this last point you know is this when we look at the chinese look at the way they have mastered the art of using euphemisms to speak to the chinese people and to the world and we believe them or we misunderstand what they say you know the, this is a great just a minute on this so what is the great leap forward great leap forward it is the largest campaign of forced abortion abortion sterilization and infanticide in human history but it is called the great leap forward what is the great leap forward i i i i i i i fail to understand the worst man made famine of all time or oh, sorry uh, the first one was one child policy so sorry the first one a uh, large campaign of forced abortion sterilization you know, is called the one child policy disaster today the uh, but it is called the one child policy many people hail it today i told the american males are shot by about 30 million mates and it is led to their you know very bad demographics so th- there are also huge opportunities for us i'm not saying that they are not huge opportunities the worst man made man made famine of all time <coughs> is called the great leap forward great leap forward what is the great leap forward in that the messaging to the chinese people and to the world and we use these terms like that as if there was some great you know good stuff happening in the famine in september 2005 who jintao says spoke of this harmonious world and if you just take the english interpretation it's wonderful china is creating this harmonious world in 2013 z talks of the chinese dream harmonizing the world according to chinese values so these two are very interesting Chinese dream. What is wrong with the Chinese dream? Everybody has a dream. We we could have a dream, but when you read these issues in context, and here I am quoting Michael Pinsbury, harmony actually means unipolar dominance. But those who are saying that we want to dominate the world in a unipolar fashion, the bad thing is harmony. When they talk of the Chinese dream, it is the Chinese determination. to become the world's only superpower unrivaled economically militarily and culturally unrivaled economically militarily and culturally <coughs> now see when this book came out china dream 2009 it is written by a colonel liu ming lu it is a very intelligent analysis of the mistakes that the soviets made eight ways in which china should be different from the soviets if they have to supplant the americans and here they un- he unabashedly says that we will need a world class military to project china's military leadership and they are, they are very clear they say okay economic might must create into diplomatic heft pri influence and now see how they are asserting themselves in latin america in africa the deal that they have brokered in west asia chinese diplomacy is the challenge to the us dollar So it's a huge way that they are mounting this this challenge, and he says this will not be a shooting duel or a boxing match, but it will be a hundred-year marathon, track and field. When does it begin? 1949. And we dismiss this in this way, that way. Now that we are closer to 2049, we are worried because we didn't take note of that. This is how long they think. Zhao Ting Yang. You know, he talks of the Chinese dream. Tiang Zia and told it in Chinese. What does it mean? Look at the, the hubris. It says China is the center of this civilized world, and what is harmonizing? Harmonizing is harmonizing the barbarians, the rest of them. What Chinese values, language, and culture? B R I. And now they are talking of internet sovereignty. a separate info e- ecosystem and here now look at this they say aapko apni azadi mubarak ko we prefer order over freedom 
ethics over mere rules. You keep talking of rules. They say you made these rules and we were not part of the world order. 20 nautical miles. Now we are. We negotiate these rules. Elite governance over democracy and HR. So what people call authoritarian meritocracy. And now the Chinese, this colonel is asked, but what if there is disagreement? If the barbarians don't agree with you, then we have, we will have this military superiority of four is to one. What is the military superiority for? To enforce the all under heaven system. This is the way they think. Then he says, the world's largest economy will need a force more powerful than others. So we need a world class military. And he says, in any case, the USA had done similarly in 1860 and 1940. So what are you preaching to us? Look at Z. I'm quoting Z now, paraphrasing Kevin Rudd from some Chinese writings. You know, it's very difficult to quote them directly. But most leaders, global leaders, will talk of economy. You know, when it, they talk of uh, strategic competition. And it also makes sense. But look at Z. He says, as important as economic prosperity is, it is military power that ultimately lies at the heart of state now. Now, if all this is true, or even if some of this is true, should Chinese surprise us? They shouldn't. We were innocent, or we believe what we shouldn't be believing. Uh, you know, so this is my, this whole... And so the challenge is not merely from the PLA, it is from the wider China's Chinese strategic military juggernaut. Now here I just want to make two points. There are two views you could take. My own view is that it is formidable, it is sophisticated, it is complex, it is deep and it is sustained for all the reasons that I have outlined. And I can give you many, many more. If this is the case, we we are not doing too badly. In fact, if you ask me, we've created a springboard. We made some changes in recent times. CDS, DMA, new novels in our strategic outlook, defense coming out of the shadows of foreign policy. A uh, whole lot of stuff is happening. But if we have to take care of China, which is the superpower on our doorstep, we need a comprehensive national security takeover, not merely incremental changes. Now, there are some who suggest that these, all that I have said is exaggerated. That PLA is a parade ground military, it is social media fluff. Now, if it is a parade ground military and it is social media fluff, there is not so much to worry about. But what if it is not? But what if it is not? And if it is actually all that my reading tells me it is, then there is a lot more to and in that sense, as I said, we have done well, we have made some basic transitions, but to take care of this China, which is which actually never was hiding and biding, we, we, we misunderstood the whole thing. They were never hiding and biding, they were building capacities, very smartly building capacity. Look at the world, how they look at a harmonious world. Look at what China's dream, unipolar, it will be a Chinese order. The barbarians will need to submit. Now, uh, is India a pushover? Certainly not. Certainly not. But given the nature of, you know, democracies, we do not respond in these surgical manners. There is debate, there is cacophony, there is this whole raucousness of democracy. Now, both for US and India, what are the challenges? The Chinese have their system. Democracies have their own systems of creativity, innovation, energy, enterprise, what the Prime Minister has been talking of, Atmanir Bharta in defense, startups. <coughs> but in this domain, we have not let go of the bureaucratic fetters. We are not changing in the creative manner in which democracies should. So to make this national security makeover, we need a cultural transformation, a new strategic, uh, or should I say more energy in our strategic outlook, structural corrections. Uh, we need, you know, a whole lot of other things that we need to do. 
to complete this national security makeover. And if we do that, we will secure Amrit Khan. We will secure India's rights. It is also my belief that the Indian military needs to change because the characteristics of a military, uh, which is uh, you know, which is uh, which, uh, which exists to protect a three trillion dollar economy, will be very different from the military that you need to secure a thirty five trillion dollar economy, which is what we will be. And that change has to begin now. Because even if you see the source of the change now, the change will actually emerge in 2047. So it is late. And it is this is my bold plea that if we have to secure India's rise, which does seem to be inevitable, <coughs> we do seem to be the geopolitical ghost of the world, leader of the G20, leader of the global south, so many things going in our favor, favorable demographics. Look at the way our economy has, you know, withstood the, the, the larger downsides which are ha happening globally. There are many good signs. A lot of things have taken off. And see, when we want to do something, look how we have come. We have emerged on top of terror. There was a time when we said, Bhai, we are a democracy. Ek banda to nikle gai, ek bomb to pate gai, ab to bomb nipat. Look at digital infrastructure. We lead the Americans. The Americans concede that our digital infrastructure is better than theirs. Look at the way we developed the vaccine. The Chinese couldn't. The Chinese haven't. Nine months and we administer it. So, bhai, jab Bharat chahata hai, to wo kya kar sakta hai? Now, that is the spirit that I invoke. And we are thinking big everywhere. Millets, we think globally. Green energy, globally. Number one. Why are we not ambitious, equally ambitious in national security? Why are we not equally clairvoyant in national security? Why are we not equally clear-eyed in national security? For example, changes in the strategic outlook. This business of India not being expeditionary. Why? Expedition, what is being expeditionary? It's not jackbooting around the world. But it is building a power system which can apply itself at progressively increasing distances from the mainland. Not to jackboot around the world, but when your national interest so demands. So power, responsible power. As Guru Gobind Singh says, Bal hoe, bandhan, bandhan chute, sab kuch lage upai. When strength accrues, shackles snap. Every move seems a strategy. Look at China today. Oh, ye karta hai, the world wonders. Are ye kyo kardiya? Oh, karta hai. What are the possibilities? Because it is a quiet power. I am saying a quiet power, responsible power. Exercise it responsibly, but let the world wonder. Let the world wonder. bandhan chute, sab kuch lage Even Mahatma Gandhi, I mean, he is an apostle of non violence, but if I am quoting him correctly, he said, True power speaks softly. It has no reason to shout. But this power apparatus has to be created diligently. Uh, it has to be. We need a comprehensive uh, change. And now, uh, just one last point. Incremental changes ka kya hota? I look at Ukraine. It did seem in October, November that Ukraine was resurgent. It did seem that, you know, Ukraine was back in business and it could possibly take the battle to Crimea. Then the West was back to its old tricks. Either dither, other dither. Poland ne bola, chauda tank, che mene ho gai, dust tank ni pounche. Clever by half nonsense. Canada ne char tank diye. Ye mag. Look at uh, things today. The Russians are back in business. So either you transform comprehensively. These are choti choti chide hairs. These will not be good enough. When you realize that you have <laughs> a behemoth like China on your doorsteps. So, in conclusion, just let me say this, that if we are conscious of the China challenge, but I'm not sure whether we are conscious of the important gravity of the China challenge. The sophistication, important gravity. And, you know, there is a loose Chinese saying, which we should never forget in the context of 1962, which says, you know, the first time I slap you, it is my fault. But the second time I slap you, it will be yours. 
that should be done. I've heard that one before coming out of China, sir. But uh, indeed, uh, something you, you brought out some very interesting points. I'd like to, if I may, uh, in my humble this thing, uh, add the factor of uh, Dr. Sanya Chen's book in 1922, uh, International Development of China, where he actually mentions and draws out a pathway for all these things. And they've actually stuck by it. And that's something very, very interesting. I'm actually in the middle of reading Michael Pillsbury's book. So that's some, I mean, it's an eye opener. That's so, amazing. Fascinating book. Um, and this I'm, is the things that we must ask in India. Now that the Americans have opened up to the challenge, there is an article or a book being churned out every week. Mm. So many books. India may, why is the strategic commentary not so rich and deep? Our ideation, we are, we are good ideators. Why are we not ideating well? We have to be honest, Kishore Mehuwani is a very good question. And we make excuses, you know, democracy, democracy. He says, open society, close minds. Close societies, open minds. Kya <laughs> so, there are so many things you know, that, uh, that uh, need to be done in this. Uh, so, uh, these are also very exciting times. Actually, I am not saying a lot of stuff is good stuff is happening. Mm. Like I spoke about the CDS DMA. Now look at the CDS DMA. What does it mean? It was not just creating CDS. It was creating a CDS, empowering the military to drive change through the national security system. The Prime Minister has said somewhere that, you know, the valor of the armed forces is all great. Valor, bravery, all that. But today we need thought leaders who can drive change through the national security system. Which, on some occasion, let me say, is even more valorous a task than sheer valor. <laughs> oh yes, sir. So, so bringing so in change in a, in a traditional okay, setup so in, in our strategic outlook, it has changed. Yang Se would perhaps tell the Chinese that salami slicing is dead. A lot of good things are happening. Defense coming out of the shadows of foreign policy. The government is telling you that defense must have a character of its own. That which complements foreign policy. That which complements foreign policy. Atmanir Bharta in defense is not an empty slogan of self-reliance. So 1947 se self-reliance. Hmm. The structures that you create for self-reliance must not be dead, must not be bureaucratic, as many of our PSUs have become. They have yeah. to become these citadels of innovation, energy, and enterprise. I'm once again paraphrasing the Prime Minister. He says, Atmanirvarta in defense is about liberating the forces of innovation, energy, and enterprise from the scourge of process and procedure. He says, mm. Now, these are the things we need to do. If we do this, <coughs> there is no reason why you know, India will be a will be a, a power to reckon with. Absolutely, indeed, sir. And as a matter of fact, uh, what we should accord with our strategic weight. Absolutely, I think uh, one of the things in the last discussion that I had with you, you had mentioned about the multi-domain threat about China, and I think this time you've elucidated that very, very clearly. Where we've uh, took upon, we, we've spoken about the variety of challenges that the Chinese, uh, you know. I wouldn't say pose, I would say force upon the world. And indeed India, of course, uh, there is no question about it. I have a small little question, sir. Just request your little comment. Uh, in this changing dynamic of, of, of the Chinese kind of trying to create a space for themselves, we see blurring lines. Uh, in the previous Cold War, the difference was that the lines were pretty strong and they were... I'm on this side, you're on that side. That's it. Here, this time, there is a bit of a challenge in terms of the lines between the two opponents. Uh, and the Chinese seems to have at the moment the best of it because they've been able to woo Europe and many other global players into their, into their game, if I may, and portray a certain superiority. How do you see these blurring lines? Will they straighten out or will it be just... 
a chaotic sort of a cold war going forward see one is this uh, while i use the term cold war 2.0 it is the metrics of this cold war are significantly different from the first cold war because it's a different world different players new technologies new perspectives so of course the world is different uh, so that you know 1.0 2.0 may, may not be an accurate uh, this is a new kind of cold war and what is really significantly different in this cold war is that the soviet union at its peak its gdp was not even 50% of the americans so the economic weight was never there in this cold war the military prowess <coughs> is being chiseled over a very strong economic framework uh, look at the trade dependency if you look at india what is our big problem if the trade uh, what what is that called the trade balance is what 60 billion dollars pushing to 100 billion dollars what economic pressures can you put on him to encourage him to behave better along the borders you don't have economic leverages the economic leverages to incentivize better military behavior are not there and so all the points the issues that you are bringing out the french have always been independent but they've also been clever every country has a right to be clever europe has already been divided always been divided and sometimes i think we fool ourselves we refuse to see reality the chinese have great presence in latin america and in africa in the global south <coughs> president lula's visit to china a new market is opening up in the sea the brics i'm told is uh, in terms of gdp is larger than the g7 today so these are new changes the chinese do matter in this uh, in this new 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 world part of the reason is that we've been sleeping america ne to inko diya weapons technology paise kahani hai so puri so you have created this nixon said i believe somewhere sometime he said that i may have created this frankenstein monster तो बनाया आपने मजबूत अब जब वो मजबूत बना है वो अपना खेल खेलेगा नाउ द इशू इज यू नो रियली दिस दिस इज द चैलेंज फॉर द सुपर पावर्स ऑफ द वर्ल्ड ऑल ऑफ देम डू प्रीटी वेल इट व्हेन इट कम्स टू स्ट्रेटजिक कंपटीशन टेक्नोलॉजी इकोनॉमिक वेट द ट्रू टेस्ट ऑफ सुपर पावर्स कम्स व्हेन दे हैव टू एक्सरसाइज मिलिट्री पावर इन परस्यूट ऑफ देयर एंबिशंस that is when they start fraying look at usa when did things start going wrong interventions in iraq and afghanistan so therefore the significance of the military apparatus is even more the role of militaries is not merely to fight wars and win them the role of militaries is to deter ki ladai hoy mat become so powerful now look at in the economic context we always hesitate <coughs> or in the strategic economic context we always hesitate to invest in our militaries when the crisis is building up in the hope that it will wither away therefore militaries don't deter now what happened for the after this unipolar moment the americans partly because of iraq afghanistan partly they neglected their military and now the military balance is such in the and what are the chinese doing all along look at how they studied the americans they said okay power projection the americans the americans have to project power from the mainland what is fundamental to power protection satellites so a sats anti satellite weapons now they are being inventorized which means when the americans try and project power if the satellites are taken out that's the end of their power projection when their naval armadas come in let's start it then with such accuracy so they have built a system of global precision strike space enabled the americans now know that their aircraft carriers will not survive in the first challenge here if they know that they won't survive will they bring them in so this is deterrence and therefore you know this whole there is a 
I think the biggest challenge before parts today is how intelligently they use their instrumental force in their statecraft. Baki mein to kafi, we are pretty okay. We do our economy as well. We are doing India ke saath ek aur samasya hai that we are lagging technologically. All these, you know, the storm of these new technologies, we really have to build on them in the... Let me give you one example of this rocket force. It is a sophisticated ecosystem of long-range strike. The Chinese have spent four decades on building such a system, which is what multiple warheads, tonnages, accuracies. Look at what missile strikes have done in the Russian-Ukraine war. Look at what these Shahzad drones have done in terms of precision. So, you know, military capacities, hai, I'm not saying, you know, go gungo about your military. But if the military matters in your statecraft, why be in consistent denial? Why say, nay, 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 ladai nahi hone wali? There is no evidence to say ki ladai nahi hone wali. Ladai ka surup badal raha. The character of war is changing. So, it is, uh, and the answer to your question is that China has economic weight. So it has the power to persuade people, persuade or coerce, depending on the diplomaties that you choose. Ah, that's that's quite a lot to actually uh, take through. So, but let me let me thank you because uh, it's 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 something that you've brought about very very beautifully. Looking at what the Chinese actually are saying. The the trouble is people don't listen to what they say, and uh, I mean good, bad, or ugly. They're going through a tough time right now with their economy and this and that. But that's what they say again. So it's it's very clear that the Chinese speak, and we must learn how to listen to them, if nothing else, or understand what they're trying to say and figure out what we need to do to protect our interests. I think that's one lesson which needs to be taken out from any study of China. Uh, you've you've given us an insight with regard to certain books and I'm sure a lot of the audience are going to be running around trying to find them. I uh, personally am going to look for uh, The China Dream. That's that's a book that I am not uh, able to put my hands on because it's very, very expensive. But I'm going to try and figure that out and get them because these are, these are some things that are going to give us a better understanding and probably as you say, sir, give us a better strategic outlook as to what we need to do for ourselves in the future. For the studying, moment, the Chinese is, uh, studying the Chinese is, is expensive business. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, 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 you know, I kind of just was about to order the book, but then it's fifteen thousand rupees. I said, okay, hang on. <laughs> you know, I just need to figure it out first. Uh, so, my, I'm absolutely grateful for you uh, that you've taken out the time to help us understand, and hoping for many, many more such knowledgeable interactions with you where we gain a little more insight as to what the challenge and what the future of India lies in the world. Till then, sir. Jai Hind and thank you. Thank you. Time. Thanks a lot, uh, Adi, for the opportunity. It was a wonderful conversation and I look forward to the next time. Hope it will be soon at this time. Thank you, sir. This time.